Great, thank you very much, Alan. And in case any of you are in any doubt, I'm Paul Seisland. Um, and uh, we're going to do a double act. And and I'm Leah Reinfrank, and I'm a nature finance intern. Yeah, we're going to talk all things nature finance today. So answer all your questions. Right, <laughs> and as we go on, you'll, you'll think that all the presenters so far have coordinated their talks because there's some very good sort of uh, common points among them all. So that's really good. So we're pretty much joined up this afternoon. Um, I should just say that um, our overall work on nature finance is generously supported by uh, the Esme Fairbairn Foundation, the Missing Salmon Alliance, the Golden Bottle Trust, and the Rivers Trust. And we'll cover any additional project-specific um, funding uh, support as we, as we go on. So ahead of COP15, so another COP for you, not COP26, COP15 in 2022, uh, the Economics of Biodiversity was published, uh, commissioned by the UK government, and authored by Professor Das Gupta. And quoting uh, Das Gupta, he said that our economies, livelihoods, and well-being all depend on our most precious asset, nature. And nature is our home. Good economics demands we manage it better. And just to summarise the 610 pages of the review so that you don't have to, basically, if we value nature, we should pay for nature. And of course, that's through nature finance, which we have been teed up to talk about. Um, so government, financial and corporate institutions are working on legislation, policies and strategies to enable this to happen. Albeit slowly, but thankfully, the penny, and we need a lot more than just pennies, is beginning to drop. Uh, and, and Fisheries Management Scotland is working with our funders, partners, agencies and government to stimulate the flow of nature finance and support our members to fund action that will improve the ecological status of our rivers. And it's a very dynamic space, and it involves many stakeholders. So closer to home, the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy commits to develop an investment plan as part of the delivery framework to mobilise public, private and philanthropic finance. And as we've heard, the Wild Salmon Strategy Implementation Plan further elaborates this for securing investments in Scotland's rivers, in line with Scottish Government's commitments to develop a high-integrity values-led market for responsible investment in natural capital. Fisheries Management Scotland and our members are making use of innovative funding uh, to support nature market creation through the FERNS programme. We heard the Minister speak about that a bit earlier. And it's also great to note that some of our members have also secured other sources of major funding from corporate contributors to advance regional projects as well. And that includes, as we've heard already, uh, from Wendy, the River Within programme, which is supported by the Shivers Brothers Whiskey, and you know they're partnering with three neighbouring river trusts um, not a million miles from here. And Elle and Guy, I believe, might touch on that um, a bit later um, this afternoon. But these are all indicators um, that uh, nature finance has a future, and I'll touch on ferns again in a few seconds. And following Sean... Um, we now have some extremely useful fishery management plans with costed actions, and I'll build on what Sean has said earlier. And it's great um, that we're being more and more ambitious for our rivers. So briefly then, on the ferns work that we've been leading on, and ferns is funded by Nature Scott and the National Lotterage Heritage, Heritage Fund, Lottery Heritage Fund, the overall objective of our firm's project is to set up a national financing mechanism um, to attract corporate finance, focusing initially on environmental, social and governance and voluntary biodiversity impact offsetting financial commitments into a national fund for, for, for nature restoration work at scale across river catchments, through the coastal zone and into the marine environment. And we're building on the successful Scottish Marine Environment Enhancement Fund uh, to recommend options to create a similar or combined fund to target investment into river catchment restoration work. So we're just reaching uh, the end of the first phase of this development project. It actually finishes tomorrow. Um, and ultimately, the fund would be available for our members, for you, to bid into to support locally prioritised river restoration actions to benefit fisheries, their management and people from source to sea. Okay, some of you will be familiar with this model. Um, it's from the Green Finance Institute, and it represents the, um, their investment readiness toolkit, 
or so-called snake diagram, and it's a model that we've been using uh, for nature market development. And starting at the left end, it guides project developers in stages on how to develop a nature finance project. And as you might expect, with any market creation, there are a number of dependencies, a number of actors, and a number of steps to fulfill to get to a new market, and this is no different. Through the firm's project, as just explained, we've been concentrating on developing the financing mechanism, including the governance, the funding model, and working with investors. But now we need to look towards the identification and elaboration of what needs to be funded and how. So moving to the project supply side, I'm going to pass you to Leah, um, who will talk about people and community and the project beneficiary side of projects. So Leah, over to you. Thanks, Paul. Um... So I'm at the tail end of a three-month internship, and so in that internship, I kind of I, I had a complementary project to what other external consultants were looking at in terms of source to see. So I was supporting Paul and the steering group in uh, helping that that project get to the the end uh, where it ends tomorrow. And so um, for my project, I specifically looked at how community benefits and inclusion could be incorporated into the funding mechanism. And that's important because if we want to realize a just transition and facilitate and improve human nature connections and human-human connections, this is a great place to, um, to make sure that we're considering when, we, when we're scaling up these restoration projects. And so to answer this question, I, I did a literature review and then also a series of interviews. Some of you in the room were part of that group, so I really thank you for the time you took to speak with me. It was really, really helpful. Um, and we can move briefly on to what I found. Um, so I did 11 interviews in total, and the focus was on freshwater and marine restoration projects, those who had been involved in those types of projects in the past or who had been involved in community-led organizations who had been involved in those because those are the types of projects, as Paul mentioned, that would be supported by Source to Sea. And so um, within those, I, I do want to mention that community is not a, it's a subjective term. It is very complex and it's quite difficult to sometimes talk about this because it depends on the context, right? Like, are we talking about communities of interest? Are we talking about geographical communities? Even within those groups, there can be a lot of heterogeneity within that. And so it can be quite complex to figure out, are we consulting? Are we, are we co-designing? Kind of, kind of how that works. And there's a lot of different options out there. But regardless, I talked to some people about, you know, what's worked in the past? What benefits have you seen come from past restoration? And then also, equally important, what disbenefits have come? You know, on, on project reports, you often don't see what maybe went, went not so well. And so I think that's important. That was important to me to understand, to see how the fund ultimately could help mitigate those or just be more aware of them. Um, and so, yeah, have some benefits and disbenefits. I do want to point out that there's a difference between some of the benefits that were, that were mentioned. So I'm categorizing them as one way, reciprocal and legacy. And one way is you actually don't need the communities to provide those benefits. So it's something like ecosystem services. So by doing a project, you could provide flood mitigation, but then there's other benefits that you actually need to engage the community with in order to provide. And then of course, there are challenges with this, you know, funding, staffing, um, time it takes to build trust, existing funding timescales, and so that, that varied greatly based on geographic lo location and also community characteristics, but I did want to mention that. And so ultimately, what I produced for my internship is a report which had recommendations to the Source to Sea Steering Group uh, to things to consider, again, with communities in mind. Um, so the first being that community benefits and inclusion need to be an active goal of the fund. It's, it's really not enough from what I've seen to just assume that they will, they will come to fruition by um, funding restoration projects alone. They really need to be also actively funded within project work. And then also, this is probably the number one thing that uh, I spoke to people about is that the, this idea of proportionality, that you can't expect uh, a, a smaller trust with, with not a lot of capacity to do the same thing as, as a larger organization. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of capacity building within the fund could be helpful there. And some people mentioned maybe decision trees with different requirements and reporting as well within those. And then there's this need to prompt people early on to consider communities so we're not engaging just to engage, not just engaging to tick a box. 
It's also kind of what would work in the geographical context. So it's not a one size fits all. And then as we spoke about today, kind of like a more holistic effort, the fund could play a role in connecting similar projects or projects that are doing maybe different things, but in the same geographical area uh, to learn from each other, both from an ecological point of view, but also community engagement and benefits. And then finally, there's a need. So we do sometimes with communities, we say number of volunteers and you know, number of events held, but sometimes that doesn't fully encapsulate what, what the benefit was or what happened. So uh, looking beyond just the quantitative and the monetary with communities in mind to look at how we can see impact in other ways. So I'm gonna hand it back to Paul to wrap us up. Great, well thanks a lot, Leah. Um, so looking at what the fund then, and this is where the fantastic work done by Sean and our members comes in, producing the ambitious five-year fishery management plans that we've just hit, heard about. Over the coming year, um, we're looking forwards to working with our members and understand the, the detail of these plans, understand these plans a bit better, to develop a portfolio of ready-to-go projects by theme, geographic cluster, and to align with the fund development work that I've already described but also um, to market for larger scale opportunity where more significant investment might be possible with these institutional investors. And we're hopeful of a subsequent Ferns grant that we've already applied for uh, to carry out this work. And we expect to hear the results of that in the next couple of weeks. But whether or not that funding comes through, we are still um, intending to go forth with, 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 that, um, with that work. So you've already seen one screenshot. This is a second sc screenshot. This is the thunder that Sean didn't steal. So this is the financial tab, and it's from the, the dashboard that summarizes the financial details of all the fisheries management plans. Now, this was taken just before the latest update, so it has slightly different figures to those that uh, Sean um, showed, but it does provide an indication of how we can use it for uh, finance purposes. So it's a powerful tool and a really useful starting point for developing that pipeline of projects that we've been hearing about. Importantly, it demonstrates that we're a joined up sector. We're well um, articulated in putting forward our strategic priorities, but importantly as well, it's of a scale in keeping with potential investment interest, and that's important. For example, um, it comprises a total of some 1,200 uh, management actions across all districts with a suite of 20 identified possible actions. Uh, just to mention that the colors on the dots on the map indicate the actions delivery status as to whether they're ongoing, planned, initiated, um, complete, and so on. And it breaks down the estimated completion times on a scale of one to five years and, and beyond. The um, level of funding secured for the actions is also indicated, which where the green shows the um, already funded actions amber partially funded and yellow unfunded. The range of sources of funding that the um, projects are being sourced from, and really importantly, um, the prospective total costs of delivering these actions. Now these figures I'm showing you now um, are true at the end of last week, but since Sean has updated the latest figures and they are launched today, as he has said, the total capital costs, so that's the top left figure in the bottom right of the diagram here um, are now around 200 million pounds with annual recurrent costs um, of uh, just over 4 million pounds and altogether a total shortfall of some 250 million. So it's a big ask um, but a sound bottom up basis to begin hardening up on a potential pipeline of investable projects with, um, with the amounts that um, they, they will cost. And it's one that we'll be working on um, to address with the boards and trusts, as already mentioned, as we go forwards. So whilst we're working hard on a range of fronts on the development of nature markets for river catchments, there's plenty more to do. We know the money's there, um, and as we have seen, we know the supply is there, the supply of projects. Working together, we need to get that pipeline established and met with appropriate finance uh, nature finance. So let's not slow down. Let's keep being ambitious for our rivers. Thanks. <laughs>